Hi, my name's Max Ventura, Maxina Ventura. I'm from East Bay Pesticide Alert, and we've been around in our various forms since um, mid-90s, early 90s, in Sonoma, originally Sonoma Pesticide Alert, and then sort of morphed. Um, I see various people who've been involved over the years. In any case, the work uh, that we do, the grassroots work has always been um, based in a no compromise kind of situation. We compromise with other activists, but no compromise around health. No compromise around health. And that's a very different distinction between us and some of the other groups out there working around pesticides issues. So, um, I wanted to give you just a little bit of background um, and tell you what to expect this evening. We have a wonderful evening ahead of a lot of information and also a lot of beautiful and inspiring photos that hopefully will inspire that reminder that we can't let go of nature. And, um, and we will be talking about what is nature throughout this evening and what is native, what is not native. Um, you're going to hear, you know, biologists, uh, a biologist's um, work on that issue and thoughts on that issue. Um, so a little bit of history. You've, you're all here, I'm sure, because you're aware in some manner of the plan to remove about a half a million trees from our East Bay Hills. Um, some of you might not know there's a plan to remove about 30,000 trees from Mount Sutro. There's a little link going on. UC is a driving force, not the only one. UC Berkeley in the hills. UCSF is a driving force around Mount Sutro. You'll hear more about that this evening, and you'll see photos of San Francisco as well as the hills. Um, so East Bay Pesticide Alert got involved January 14th of uh, 2005. It's a memorable day for many reasons uh, in my life. Um, I saw a little thing in the Tribune saying there was this plan that Friends of Sausal Creek was calling for the city of Oakland to allow another, an exemption to what they what had been called a ban on pesticide use um, because they wanted to use it around Sausal Creek. They wanted to use various herbicides around Sausal Creek. Woo, our radars went up. And in fact, this was very familiar to me because it was the Ecology Center in Sonoma Valley uh, that had been calling for pesticide use in the creeks in Sonoma. When I say pesticides, that constitutes herbicides, insecticides, rodenticides, fungicides, bactericides, and so on. So, um, you know, we snapped into action to um, provide tremendous information to all kinds of agencies involved. Um, you can go to our website to learn more of the down and dirty of all that. But just want you to know that um, things started a few, years, a few years before that. Things were sort of gearing up, but Nobody we'd known had heard about this plan until that time period, so January 2005. We went in like gangbusters to, to try to stop this program, having no idea at that point the scope of the plans. We had no clue that it was what it is. What we did know is that pesticide use is never the answer. You can learn a lot more about that by going to the website, and I don't want to take any more time other than to really impress upon you that we handed information to every agency head you can imagine at a hearing January 26th of 2005, so that if they had had no real understanding of dangers of pesticides, they had no excuse after that. They had a pile of toxicological information. And they also had... Um, over that year and, and part of the next year, tremendous amount of information about possible alternatives to their plans. Um, again, read up about it on the website. What I'd like to do is see if, if Lynn Hovland is here at this point. Has she made it? Oh, there you are, Lynn. Okay, hi. Um, I want to introduce Lynn Hovland from uh, the Hills Conservation Network, which is one of many groups that's been working on this, and they've been focusing a lot on the uh, on the, the Berkeley aspect, and she, she will give us a little bit of a background there. This plan is going from Richmond to Hayward, sometimes people say Castor Valley, it includes Chabot Park, kind of up to the, like up to Hayward. Um, it's a dramatic plan, changing the landscape, um, and we need to stop it. We need to stop it from, from going further. So Lynn. Hills Conservation Network began in 2006 as a small neighborhood group that was concerned about the UC removal of non-native trees in Claremont Canyon. 
At that time, a, um, a native plant organization called the Claremont Canyon Conservancy, which is sort of an offshoot of the California Native Plant Society, was sponsoring some of this um, removal of non-native trees, which was done without any plan, no approval, you know, nothing had been done to, uh, they, they were just cutting down trees. So our group, our core group of HCN is still just five people. But we have hundreds of allies, and we are committed to saving as many trees and animal habitat as possible while, while eliminating the use of pesticides in the East Bay Hills watershed. We did a lot of work with a great deal of help from many of you to defeat the FEMA DEIS proposals that will, if successful, remove approximately 80,000 non-native trees in the East Bay Hills from Point Pinole to San Leandro. These projects target exclusively the non-native species. One major problem is that the vegetation that will replace the non-native species will only increase the fire danger. They will be chaparral and grassland, which are much more difficult to fight in a, in a fire than, than um, trees, which, may, which retain a lot of moisture. It requires enormous amounts of garlon. We estimate 31,000 gallons applied to the stumps of the trees to kill them over 10 years plus a huge amount of other herbicides that will be used to knock down the thistles, hemlock, and broom that will emerge without the loss, with the loss of canopy. But you already know much of this because you've been engaged in this fight with us. During the campaign to attack the FEMA DEIS, at least three petitions to FEMA were circulated with a total of more than 8,000 signatures. We have heard that FEMA has received 3,500 written comments, with a vast majority of them attacking the DEIS. Now we are awaiting FEMA's decision. The Claremont Canyon Conservancy and UCB have always been confident that the proposals would be accepted. These are the proposals to cut down all of these trees. We in the Hills Conservation Network will continue to fight those at UCB in the city of Oakland and in the East Bay Regional Park District that want to remove non-native trees. I'll tell you that the appointment of Janet Napolitano as president of the UC system is a setback. It is possible that the decision about accepting or rejecting the DEIS will be made in Washington instead of at the regional office in Oakland. Diane Feinstein really wants those trees removed and we expect her to pressure Napolitano to agree to it. And Feinstein's husband, as you probably know, is a regent at, uh, in the UC system. We want you to know how important we think it is to keep our coalition together. Please call us or send us email if you think there's anything we can do to help. We recently decided to sell t-shirts to raise money for the lawsuit that we think may be in inevitable. I'm hoping that the t-shirts are being printed this weekend, but I haven't seen them yet. <laughs> we did a lot of thinking about the words and the design. These are two we considered. The one we like best, and we think this is the one that will be used unless our leader, Dan Grissetti, has changed it at the last minute. We hope it will look good on a t-shirt because it says it all. Preserve urban forests for the next generation. I'd like to welcome up um, Rupa Bozo. Oh, here you are. <laughs> um, from Save Ma uh, Mount Sutro Forest. And she will be um, speaking and offering you visuals. I'm Rupa Bose, and I'm the webmaster for SaveSutro.com. This is a website we set up in 2009. Um, this was not the beginning of our fight for Sutro Forest. I came in in the middle. There are other people here like Paul Rotter in the audience who's been fighting this far longer than I have. But basically the story is that there is this wonderful forest which is on UCSF property. It's 60 acres, it's behind their campus. And it is 
unexpectedly beautiful. It's the kind of place where if you walk in there, um, you're in a neighborhood, you're in a perfectly urban setting, and then all of a sudden you're in a forest. And it's a dense forest of eucalyptus with a very dense understory. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, the problem, at the, up to now, uh, UCSF has actually done a pretty good job of managing it. There are no pesticides being used. There are some, uh, usable trails in the forest. They've kept it open to the public. It is, um, they have a, a, a region's resolution keeping it open to the public. Everything's about to change. Okay, this, this shows you where it is and you can see why it, it's such an unexpected kind of a forest. Um, is the screen visible from, yeah? Can, can we maybe, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, UCSF's estimate is that this 61 acres has 45,000 trees on it. When I say everything's about to change, they have recently published a draft environmental impact report by which they, in which they plan to cut down 90% of the trees on three quarters of the acreage that they own, mow down 90% of the understory, and then potentially use large amounts of toxic herbicides like Roundup and Garland to prevent the regrowth. They're thinking of starting with just seven and a half acres. Those are called the demonstration plots. And in their story to the public, they're saying, well, we're only going to do seven and a half acres. That's just a fraction of the reserve. First of all, even that's quite a lot. That's about 3,000 trees. Secondly, the, the EIR makes it clear that they intend to expand this to 46 acres, which is three quarters of the reserve. This is a picture of what some parts of the forest look like now. Imagine just one tree here and no undergrowth. So the history of this is that in 2001, um, they had formulated a milder version of this plan. They were only going to cut down trees on half the acreage, not three quarters, and they were go going to start with a two acre demonstration plot. That was bad enough and that roused the neighborhood and started the battle. It was never actually implemented, mainly for lack of funds and also because of the popular opposition. In 2008, and this is, begin, this is where it's going to begin to start from sounding familiar, UCSF went to FEMA and said, give us money to mitigate the very severe fire hazard in this forest by cutting down trees. Well, this is de facto a cloud forest, as I will show you, and it's moist all the time, right through the summer. In fact, uh, two summers ago when we had a particularly cloudy a foggy summer, it was difficult to even go into the forest. There was that much mud in it. Um, I call it, so uh, FEMA had questions about the fire danger, whether there really was this very severe fire danger. Cal Fire says there isn't. And they wanted proof that it would reduce the risk, not increase it. Um, in fact, they had so many questions that UCSF decided to withdraw its grant application. But it said that it would go ahead with the project anyway, hence the DIR that came out. Does this begin to sound similar to the UC Berkeley thing where they've said that they will proceed with the project even if they don't get the FEMA funding? So here's what FEMA actually wrote and this is what caused UCSF to withdraw its application. It said that UCSF inaccurately interprets a map. It provides inadequate details regarding the history of wildfire it provides a simplistic and ineffective comparison of the wildfire hazard in Sutro Forest to the hazards in other areas. So why are they doing this? According to UCSF, the forest's not healthy. There are too many trees in overcompetition. The trees can't regenerate because of the heavy understory, but it still has too many trees. <laughs> And it's a monoculture that's vulnerable to pests. Somehow nobody ever says this about Muir Woods. This forest has got actually more species of uh, vegetation than Muir Woods has. The only trees that have been planted so far in the forest after the eucalyptus was planted 100 years ago 
our oak trees, which as everybody here probably knows, are very vulnerable to sudden oak death. So, um, and somehow they think that making, chopping down 90% of the trees and ripping out 90% of the understory is going to improve its health. They also still say it's a fire hazard. And for some reason, felling 90% of the trees and 90% of the understory and then leaving that stuff there as chips and logs is going to reduce the fire hazard. So we actually went to a couple of certified arborists and asked them to take a look at the forest. And what they wrote to us is, we saw a thriving forest and removing existing trees will not improve the forest's health, it'll send the forest into a decline. We got an opinion from Dr. Mascaro, who is a Stanford um, ecologist. And what he said was that he saw a diverse functioning ecosystem. There's a difference between a forest and an individual tree. A forest can have dead trees in it and still be healthy. In fact, dead trees or dying trees are part of a forest. It's like part of any po population. And so, it's just an excuse. So, as far as the fire hazard goes, Cal Fire actually r rated Sutro Forest as a moderate fire hazard. That's Cal Fire's lowest rating. They don't have any rating below moderate. Opening the forest will actually dry it out. Um, in the interior green belt, where they've built a trail and removed 50 trees, you can see the difference between the areas where they've removed the trees and they haven't removed the trees. And then in the FEMA application, UCSF used erroneous fire hazard maps, which is why FEMA reacted the way it did. So I'm not going to hammer that point too much, but you know, essentially this is a forest that stays damp by capturing the moisture in the fog and then trapping it in that dense understory and in the layer of the duff. When you thin it, you dry it out. And um, it's an extremely windy area of San Francisco, so not only will you dry it out, you also make it easier for a fire to move through the forest if a one actually ignites. And then you have the wind throw factor, which means that not just the trees that you're cutting down will go, but other trees which have been used to the protection of the, those trees will also be knocked down by that wind. In other words, it's going to be a mess that is actually much more hazardous. Here's what it looks like. It's a cloud forest. This is a typical marine layer picture in San Francisco. I took it from a plane when we were coming into land. This is the fog drifting in over the tops of the trees. As you can see, it's, it's one of the most beautiful places I know in San Francisco. And this is how the cloud forest effect works. The trees grab the moisture and it rains down. It actually rains down. I wear a raincoat when I go in there in summer. And it's trapped in the understory and in, in the duff. This is another cloud forest picture. So I'm not going to hammer up the, the fire hazard thing. It's, we've got details explaining that it's not likely. Um, so why are they doing it? The people who are currently managing the forest are volunteers um, that are helping UCSF out. UCSF's fired nearly all its gardeners who used to look after the forest. And so the Sutro stewards are keeping the trails open, which is wonderful. It enables us all to use the forest. But unfortunately, they do have a native plant bias. And so what they would like to do is eventually to convert all of this gradually to native plants. What we are finding very difficult to understand is why UCSF is buying into this, because you've got a, a low maintenance or no maintenance forest. If you have a native plant garden there, it takes hours and hours of work to maintain it. They have a small one on, on the summit, and the Sutro stewards have volunteers there all the time. Since they're managing it without using pesticides, um, they use mulch, they use cardboard, and they use people pulling up weeds. And it's still got weeds in it. So if you do this to the whole forest, you'll need an army of people to keep it that way without pesticides. So they're going to use pesticides. I'm not going to go into the ecosystem services. I think I'd be preaching to the already converted. Um, 
but you know, basically the forest does a lot of things for San Francisco, for the neighborhoods around it, and for everybody. So there are no pesticides being used now. And they say that they're going to use pesticides only as a last resort. One of the things they're going to do in phase one is they're going to have three acres, they're going to use pesticides on one acre, they're going to try tarping on the second acre and manual removal on the third acre. They have set the bar at 85% regrowth control. Guess who's going to win that one? So the natural areas of Rec and Park say the same thing, that they only use pesticides as a last resort. These are what the graphs of the natural areas pesticide use look like. And you can see that in the last five years, it's only gone up, and gone up quite substantially. This is what the DEIR is proposing as pesticide use in Sutro Forest. The yellow bar right at the bottom, that's what the Natural Areas Program, which I was just grumbling about one slide ago, is using on 1,100 acres that it owns. Um, the brown bars shows the planned pesticide use in Sutro Forest. They will have to keep spraying pesticides for seven years after they've finished treating an area. It's basically five to 15 times on, six, on 46 acres. So, as you might expect, people oppose the plan. We put out a petition there, I guess, in April, and we have already 3,500 signatures. The DEIR received um, 189 written comments, of which only 20 supported the plan. At the public hearing, we had more than 50 people speaking, and the overwhelming majority opposed the plan. We're estimating something like 80 to 90% of people who've been in touch with UCSF have opposed the plan. People love this forest. I mean, I, I think there are few people here who've actually visited it. But they use words like magical, paradise, spiritual, enchanted. It's, a, it, it's one of those places which is just absolutely lovely. And so we're doing our best to save it. So what you can do to help us, uh, go to savesutro.com. There's a what you can do um, tab there. Uh, please take a look, write to the decision makers. We're hoping that if enough people write to them saying, look, this is a beautiful treasure that you've got, don't trash it. We're hoping that they will respond because we're hoping that UCSF really doesn't have an interest in managing um, a native plant garden on 40 acres of its property. So please, if you're on Facebook, like us on Facebook, stay in touch. Thank you. <laughs>